So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through the skeletons and specification for the next programming assignment. So here's how this works. When you run the, when you run the, the app, once your program works, you'll have this cool little options menu, which you can get to by going to the upper right-hand corner and clicking on this. And you can see that this is the image crawler. And uh, to avoid scaring people, there's a ladybug, not a spider, but it's sort of the same idea. It's something, it's a bug, it's not a bug, it's an insect, it's crawling. And you'll see that you have a couple of different options to select here. You can select which implementation you want to do. Do you want to do the sequential loops crawler? I'll explain more about that in a second. Do you want to do the fork join crawler? We'll start with the sequential loops crawler. You can also select if you want to do it locally or remotely. Local will read the files out of your local machine, so it's going to be really fast. Remote will actually go to the network and download it, so it'll be a little slower because you're paying the network latency overhead. You can turn on some transforms. Do you want to do grayscale? Do you want to do null transform? I'll, I'll turn those on here. Those are the image uh, filters that get applied. You can also modify many different things, how stuff looks. There's different ways to modify that. You can change how fast you want the program to run. You want it to run super fast. You want it to run it slower so you can see it better. You can also change the transparency of this panel. You can see if you slide this over like that, you can see the background a little better, or you can make it more opaque. And you can also turn on logging. So there's a bunch of things you can do. I'm going to do it real simply for right now just to kind of give you the idea of how it works. So I'm going to go over here and click the search button. And this goes to my website. That's where it starts from. And you click the download button. And this is a sequential implementation. So you can see what it's going to do is right now it's downloading the image. And when it's downloaded, you can see it. And you can see it's doing it in, in a sequential order. It's doing one thing at a time. Also, if you take a look. Um, Oh, and I should also have noted that it's transforming the images also. Let's see if I can change this so it's a little bit easier to tell what's going on. Um, so each image that I'm downloading is being transformed. It's a little hard to see, but you can see, for example, that this image here has been grayscaled. So it's no longer color. It's, it's turned into grayscale. This will also tell you how many images have been downloaded and processed so far, how many threads we have, and how long it's taking to do the operations. So as you can see, the sequential version takes a fairly long amount of time to run because everything's working sequentially. So let's go ahead and stop that. We stopped that by clicking on the X. And so now it, it stops the processing. So now let's have some fun. Let's go over here and let's switch from the sequential version to the fork join version. So now let's come over and try this again. Once again, we can start downloading everything. And you can see, look, lo and behold, all of a sudden, it's now doing things in parallel. So it started off doing all these in image downloads in parallel. And you'll see in a second, as they finish, can you see up there? See the little thing that looks like it's going through a filter? That's applying the filter. The spinning CD-ROM is, is indicating it's downloading. So that's showing you stuff is downloading. It, then it's going through the filter, and as stuff gets finished, it then will show up as the completed image. And right now, you can see things are running. Uh, a bunch of operations are running at the same time. My computer has four cores on it. So at any given time, you should see roughly four-ish things going. Um, looks like all the small images have finished. And now, shortly, we should start seeing the larger images finish. And uh, as those things finish, I'll let it run for a little bit longer. There we go. So now you can see other things are happening. It's transforming. It's filtering. Stuff showing up. So the cool thing about this approach is it's running in parallel, whereas the previous approach was running sequentially. Yes? So the question is, why is this running faster than the sequential one? Why does it? What's that? Well, it is actually running faster than the sequential one. Uh, well, I, 
Oh, I wouldn't actually say it's running faster or slow. I wouldn't say it's, it is running faster. It's running a lot faster. Um, but here, let me show you. The, the reason why it may not appear to be running faster is because it's paying the overhead of the, the network. So let me show you something to make it more clear. Let's go up here and let's switch from remote to local. All right, so now it's reading things. <clears throat> now it's going to be doing things. Hopefully, it'll work. It should read them out of the local cache. So watch. Let's see if what happens here. OK, so now it's, this is, um, let's see. So this is doing it sequentially. Let's see how long it takes to do two images. Or let's see how long it takes to do four images. That's a good question. So it downloaded the image first, and now it's applying the image filtering to it. And when that filter is done, it should show up with whatever the, um, uh, now I think it's writing out to disk. There we go. OK, so now it's done now. So that took, that took about a minute. So let's stop that. Now let's go over here. Let's switch it over to fork join crawler. So I think you would agree that it's running a lot faster now, right? Because it's doing all that stuff in parallel. Um, so this is the parallel version. The other one was the sequential version. So the parallel version works way, way, way faster than the sequential version. And that's because it's taking advantage of the parallelism. Uh, the previous version that we ran was doing it over the network. And the network is just slow down here. But you can see that parallel computing really speeds things up drastically compared to the sequential version. So in the time it took us to do you know, less than three images, now we've got quite a number of images in the process of either downloading or filtering, or they're already finished. OK, so that's basically how the, that's basically how the app runs. So why is this app useful? Because it'll help make it really clear when you're debugging your program whether it's working or not. Right? So as you're writing your program, if you run it and it never finishes, or you only download a few of the images, or they download in some strange way, you can tell at a glance what's going on. So now that you've seen how the program runs, let's take a look at the specification of the program. So this is basically a program that's going to give you experience using Java 8 functional programming and integration with the Java fork join pool. And so you'll develop a portion of this app that allows you to use the fork join pool to obtain, store, and transform the images. Obtain could be downloading if you're doing it across the network, or it could just be reading it off the local file cache if you're doing it in local mode. As you saw, unlike assignment one, where you just had a test that ran, this one's going to actually have an app. So you can run the app, and the app will help you figure out what's going on. The uh, actual file that you'll have to implement is called forkjoincrawler.java, and it's buried deep in the heart of the framework. There's, there's a lot of code here, most of which you can ignore. And this is what does the image uh, crawling and the image transformation. I will show you that skeleton code in a second. And again, you can either do it off the local file system or off the remote file system. I would strongly recommend you use the local file system for most of your tests because it'll be a lot faster. To get you started, there's an implementation of a sequential version that just uses loops using Java 7 features called sequential loops crawler.java. And that'll give you sort of a baseline way to see how the framework behaves. And so what you'll be doing here is you'll be taking bits and pieces of that code and then converting it to work with the fork join pool. Obviously, you'll have to use a bunch of fork join stuff along the way. You'll also have to, to take your array.java file and integrate that so that whatever you did for assignment one, you'll very first thing you'll do is go move that into assignment number two. And uh, that way, you'll use that for the implementation. We actually, I don't actually think, uh, wait, I take it back. I think we use that here. So you'll need to have that. If you don't have it working properly, then your program won't work. So make sure you fix any problems that are remaining. Hopefully, everybody got their program working for assignment one. Um, you're welcome to do whatever you want. The, the undergrads can use for loops. The grad students should try to use something with um, 
uh, Java 8, but everybody's welcome to use the Java 8 stuff, the for each loops and so on, just to be a more um, J Java functionally oriented. You can get the skeleton code here in my GitHub account, which I uploaded a little while ago. We'll look at that code in a second. Whoops. And there's a bunch of unit tests. I'll show you what those look like in a second. And uh, they will essentially run your program and compare it against what the expected output should be to see if you got the same result. So you should be able to just right click on it to run it all. And um, let's see. We had covered the fork join framework stuff in weeks four and five of this class. So go back and watch the videos for that. And there's also some other nice material from my uh, colleague Doug Lee talking about the fork join pool, just if you want some deeper understanding. So this will give you a chance to use the fork join pool framework APIs directly. It's somewhat tedious, because, as you'll see, because fork join pool requires you to do all the splitting and or uh, iteration yourself. You're in control of it. Um, so start early. Don't wait too long. I'll, I'll upload at the end of class. I'll put the due date. It'll probably be about in a week and a half or so. And uh, make sure that you test everything running the unit test. Make sure you run it with the app to make sure that it works. OK, so that's kind of the overview of the specification. Make sure you always take a look at the index.html file, which is what has the instructions on how to write the program. All right, now let's do something here. Let's see, let's go to Android Studio. So now we're in Android Studio, and here is the test program. All you should have to do is just right click, click on this and say run tests. As you can see, what it's doing is it's downloading all the files, and then it's going ahead and testing against the files that are downloaded to see whether your program ends up with the results that are the same as expected by the test program. And we'll probably do what we did for assignment one. We'll add some more tests over time. But for the first go around, you should focus on implementing this, running the user interface, and then running the unit test to see what it does. There's also the assignment 1b tests are also integrated here as well. So we have assignment 2a tests and assignment 1b tests. And like I said, we'll probably add some more tests over time. But for right now, you should be focusing on getting it to work through other means. So here's the sequential loops crawler. This is what your fork join crawler will be based on. If you take a look at this, it has a method called perform crawl. Everything that's shown in this method is done sequentially. All the code is provided here. It first checks to see if you've exceeded the max depth. That's just to make sure that you don't end up going recursively forever. Uh, and what will happen in this case is that, let's say for sake of argument, that it's not going to be uh, going the max step, so it's going to keep going. It's then going to go check to see whether or not we've already visited this page. This becomes important if your HTML file that's being traversed through has recursive uh, links that lead back to the same place ultimately. So we make sure we stick each URI that we're looking at into a map so we can identify duplicates and skip them. And then finally, assuming we've got a valid URL to a page that we haven't seen yet, Here's what the sequential version is going to do. It's going to go ahead and use a call from the library. This is called Web Page Crawler, which is actually over here in the utils directory. See, Web Page Crawler. You say Web Page Crawler get page, and you pass in the URI that you want to get. And that will go ahead and open up that content and use the JSOUP library to download that particular uh, web page. So it gets stored in this data structure called crawler.page. So that's the web page that we've downloaded. That's a representation of that. Then the next thing that happens in the sequential version is it goes ahead and it says, hey, take that web page that was downloaded, get all the images on the page, and then process those images. Get images on page is a helper function that, that we provide that goes ahead and gets those images. And uh, it gives it back essentially as a, as a collection of the image URLs to those images. And then process images, as we'll see in a second, does the, the work. Um, and what that'll give you back is the number of images on the page. And so that's just going to be a count. It'll also go ahead and download those images. 
The next thing, we're, and we'll take a look at the process image method in a second. Everything here is done sequentially. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and call crawl hyperlinks on page. What this does is it takes the page and it goes and it finds all the hyperlinks on the page and it recursively will crawl through all of them. And notice how we pass in the original page we're starting out with as well as the depth plus one because we're recursively doing this and we want to make sure that we don't exceed the depth. That will also give us back a count of the number of images that were accessible through those page links. And then we take the images on page, uh, images on the page count, and we add that to images on page links count, and that becomes the count of the whole thing. Okay, so let's take a look now at process images. So what process images is going to do is it's going to take this array of URLs, and that array, of course, is your array that you wrote from the previous assignment. And for the sequential version, it's simply going to iterate through this from beginning to the end of this list of, array of URLs. And it's going to call get or download image, which depending on the configuration settings will either go out to the web and download it, or it'll just read it out of the cache. In either case, you end up with an image. If you get a valid image, then it'll call this method called transform image, which will take the raw image and apply transforms to it. We'll look at those in a second. And then it's going to iterate through every transformed image and just increment a count of each image. So we'll know how many of these things were transformed. Transforming is applying the image filter, like converting it to grayscale, for example. And this method returns a number of images that were transformed. Here's the transform image method. This is going to make a new array of images, which are going to be the transformed images. And then we're going to iterate through all the transformations, and there's a basically a list of transformations. And for every transformation that we have, we're going to go ahead and say create new cached image, passing in the image and the transform to apply to it. And that'll go ahead and do the image processing. As something is transformed properly, we go ahead and add that to our transform array after we apply the transform. And so when we're all done, we'll end up with a transform array that contains all the transformed images that were downloaded. And that will come back through here, which will be counted. So that's how we do process image. Again, keep in mind all of the stuff that I'm showing you here is done sequentially. Up here is where things get interesting. This is the crawl hyperlinks on page method. And what this does is this will go through every hyperlink on the page. So we call get page elements as string. So we pass in, or, or sorry, we take the page that we've got and we say, I want to know all the hyperlinks on this page. And we end up with basically a for each loop, one for every hyperlink. You know, if you think about a web page, you can have hyperlinks on it. That's the ahref stuff. And then we take that URL to the thing that was just downloaded, or sorry, to the, to the hyperlink that was on the page, and we recursively call perform crawl. So if you recall, perform crawl was this method up here. And we just keep incrementing the number of images that were downloaded as part of this process. Perform crawl returns a count of the number of images that it downloaded. And then when we're all done, the results are returned. Okay, so that is basically the starting point for your implementation. So now that you've seen how the sequential version works, your job is going to be to implement the fork join crawler version. And here's what the fork join crawler version looks like. We've got the fork join crawler, and I gave you some of the code. For example, we have the perform crawl method, except unlike the sequential version that we just looked at where the bulk of the logic in the sequential version is performed in perform crawl. In the fork join version, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and use the common fork join pool, and we're going to invoke a starting point URL crawler task. And this URL crawler task, you'll have to implement a portion of it. And it's going to take the page URI, which is the starting point for the traversal, and the initial depth, which would start out being, say, zero uh, or one. I think it starts out with zero. And that will go ahead and schedule this task to run in the fork join pool. So that's the first thing it's going to do. It's going to stick that into the fork join pool. 
So let's take a look at URL crawler task. So URL crawler task is a recursive task, and it's going to perform a web crawl from a particular starting point, and that's what's going to be passed in and stashed away in a local field. And because it's extending recursive task, we can use it to run in parallel in the fork join pool. And as you saw when we ran the program earlier, that allowed everything to run in parallel, so it was a lot faster. Here's the URI that we're crawling. We just have to keep track of that. Here's the current depth. You'll see why we need that in a second. Here's the constructor. As you can see, it just takes its parameters and stashes them away in the local fields. Here's how it was called here. We said new URL task with the initial starting point URI and the initial depth. Here's where things get interesting. Here is the compute method. Remember, recursive task has a compute method that has to be filled in by whoever's implementing or extending recursive tasks. So this is the code that you're going to have to write. I provided some of the code for you. So we check to see if the max depth has been uh, exceeded. If it is, we return zero. We check to see if we've already seen this URL before, this URI before. If so, we return zero because we're done. Otherwise, we have to do something interesting. And here's where you have to write some of your code. There's other code to write elsewhere. So what we're going to do here at a high level is we're going to use the fork join pool to download and process images on this page and also crawl other hyperlinks accessible via this page. And that will all take place in parallel. So I gave you the code here. You just go ahead and get the uh, initial URI. You, you get the, the HTML that corresponds to that initial URI. That gets stored here on this page. That's pretty much exactly like what we do here in the sequential version. But all of a sudden, things are going to diverge quite a bit. So what you're going to do next, and, and you have to write this code, you'll have to make a list of fork join tasks starting that's initially empty. And you're going to have to use that to process all the images and hyperlinks on the page. So you'll have this, this list of fork join tasks here. And then you're going to iterate through, and, and the, key, the key word here is iterate through all the images and hyperlinks on this page. So we'll use a helper method that comes out of the, the page data structure. Remember, page is the crawler.page data structure. And we're going to say, get me all the images and get me all the pages. And for each of these page elements, we check to see, is it an image or is it a page? And depending on what it is, then you're going to go ahead and create the appropriate type of task object to process that element. And you're going to fork that task object, and you're going to place it in the list of fork tasks. And you're going to do that for images, and you're going to do that for hyperlinks. Remember, there's two things. There's images and there's hyperlinks. Those are the two things that we're going to be discerning here with our get page elements method. When you're all done with this loop, your list of fork join tasks will have a bunch of things in them, and they will all have been forked and that will all have been added to the list. And then what you're going to come down here and do is you're going to go ahead and join all the tasks in the list of fork tasks, because they're all running out in parallel now. And you're going to get the final result, which will be the number of images on that page. You have to accumulate that, as you call join. So that's how you're going to implement compute for the URL crawler task. Let's go down here and take a look at the other task. And and by the way, the two tasks you're going to have to create here, of course, are going to be what we're about to talk about. So one of the tasks you're going to have to do is a process image task. And the process image task is this recursive task that downloads, processes, and stores an image. And once again, you're going to be able to keep track of the image that you're working on. And then you're going to have to implement portions of the compute method. And so what you're going to have to do here is you take the um, image, we get the image, so now we've got the image, and now you're going to have to create an initially empty list of fork join tasks that will be used to transform the image in parallel. And then you're going to have to write essentially a, a loop that iterates through all the transforms, creates the appropriate task object that transform the image, fork it, and add it to the list of fork tasks. And then when you're all done forking everything, then you're going to go ahead and join everything. Well, that sort of begs the question, what are we forking? And what we're forking, and sorry, what are we creating and forking? 
we're creating and forking something called perform transform task, which is also a recursive task. And that's going to essentially stash the image and the transform to work on. And then the compute method here will go ahead and apply the transform properly to do the transformation of that image. And it'll return the, the transformed image. So the way to do this, the way to get this to work is to do a couple things. You need to first look at the sequential version to really understand what it's doing. And once you understand the sequential version, then you'll have to break up the sequential version pieces and stick them into the skeleton for the fork join crawler version. And you'll have to figure out how to do the fork join logic properly. And the way to really figure this out is to go back and look at the video that we did from, I think it was week four, where I showed you a bunch of examples of how to program fork join tasks. So that's essentially what the skeleton is. A couple other things to remember. Um, grad students need to try to use Java 8 stuff wherever you possibly can. Uh, undergrads are welcome to do so, but you can use you know, Java 7 loops. Uh, you should be able to get, you should be able to use things like the for each statement in lieu of a, a loop most places you would need to do a loop. So that should be easy to do. Okay, any questions about this? So the skeletons are uploaded. They are hopefully all in good order. The test should work. So please start soon, and I will update the website with the due date. It'll probably be um, like Thursday, a week from Thursday. So you'll have about a week and a half. It's not a lot of code to write, but it's very subtle. And the time you'll spend will be figuring out what the program is actually doing in the sequential version in order to convert it to the parallel fork join version.